Okay, no then, yeah, welcome everyone to the weekly colloquium of the Physics Institute of the UNAM in Cuernavaca in Mexico. Um, our guest today is Professor Dante Kennis from the um, RWTH University in Aachen in Germany. And let me say some few words on this Vita. So Dante did his PhD at the Rheinisch Westfälische Technische Hochschule, in short RWTH, in Aachen, in Germany. And he did then several postdocs. Um, one at the Columbia University in the United States, and at the Free University of Berlin, and then at the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany. Since 2019, he is a professor for theoretical condensed metaphysics at the RWTH in Aachen and a visiting scientist at the Max Planck Institute for the Structure and Dynamics of Matter in Hamburg. His research activities address quantum matter on demand, non equilibrium quantum many body physics, renormalization group approaches, density matrix renormalization group theory, transport properties of strongly correlated electrons and topological matter out of equilibrium. He's also of more than 100 publications, summing more than 4,000 citations, and he has an age index of 30. So Dante, thank you very much for joining us today, and we are looking forward to your talk. Although I think that Dante left us just one minute ago, I think, I hope he will show up, um, that he will show up soon again. Hello again. Ah, hi. All right. So on time, I guess my internet broke down. Oh, so, okay. So uh, I hope this doesn't happen again. Okay. So, but now you can see and hear me. Yes, we can see and hear you. We can see your presentation. So um, I just finished your presentation. All right. Doctor, and um, yeah, please go ahead. Good. Go ahead. All right. Well, sorry about that. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, so I missed my own introduction. So I'm just going to say I'm Dante Kennis. I have a dual affiliation with the uh, Arbeiter Aachen uh, University and the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. And I want to present some results on um, that's kind of accumulating research that we did in the last couple of years, where we kind of try to establish Moray heterostructures as uh, ways of thinking about condensed matter types of quantum simulators. Um, so to just introduce our research real quick, um, we mainly focus on pathways of controlling or designing material properties. We are a theory group and we do research roughly structured along these three pillars that you see um, here. Um, so today I will talk about the central pillar only, but just to give you a brief introduction. So we're also thinking about um, shining light on materials so exciting um, a material and trying to alter properties of the material uh, that way. Then there's the central column that we'll focus on today. That's you know when you cleverly layer materials on top of each other, you can try to modify material properties in this um, fashion. And then in the third column here, um, we have this newly emerging field of catatronics where the idea is somehow similar to the um, leftmost column, um, but you try to couple two quantum fluctuations in the best case of, of a light field that is confined in a, in a tiny, tiny cavity. All right, so I'll we'll focus here today on this um, central column. 
um, Van der Waals heterostructuring. And in particular, we'll um, mainly talk about this first bullet point here, uh, Moray engineering. If you want more details on any of these um, topics here, then uh, I give you some references here on these different topics, uh, which are review type articles, where you can, of course, find many more references of many people um, that you might find interesting. All right, so we'll uh, jump right into the uh, introduction of my talk. Um, and what we want to talk about is the Moray effect. So um, condensed matter, in condensed matter, this um, Moray engineering has um, made quite some waves recently. So um, many of you might be familiar with this, but um, sort of connect to everyone. I brought this very introductory um, part of uh, this talk. So the Moray effect is an effect that is just a geometric effect. It's not quantum. And you can see it in you know, everyday's life all the time uh, when you look closely. So for example, if you look um, at a photograph, and I brought this here from Wikipedia uh, on the upper left here, um, and you photograph these typical, in Germany, we have lots of these buildings, these uh, wall brick structures, then you have an interference pattern between you know, the fine structure of the wall brick and then you know, the uh, final resolution of your camera. And you see that these concentric fringes emerge in this picture. This is, of course, not part of the building here. Um, this is just this um, geometric interference effect. And that's what's called a Moray effect. And you can do that with um, almost any kind of um, patterns that you, you know, superimpose on top of each other. Here are some other examples. For example, here in this little animation, I hope this is playing um, okay-ish for you. Let me just optimize for video real quick. Um, now you should see the animation more smoothly, I hope. Um, so you see these concentric circles. Um, can you give me feedback whether this is at all visible? Since I'm now yes. a bit afraid that yes. the internet connection is so bad. Yeah, no, it's no, okay. It's, it's visible and you can see the effect. Okay, very good. Great. So um, yeah, so we have these concentric circles and um, we start to slide the one pattern over the other, you see this very nice geometric interference effect. Or um, in this example here on the uh, lower left, these are just parallel lines, um, red lines and green lines put on top of each other. And then you know you don't shift, but you do a little twist of the uh, green top layer. And what you see is these uh, long wavelength, one dimensional structures that emerge due to the twisting of the two. Uh, patterns on top of each other. And this example here with the parallel lines on the lower left will actually be relevant to one of the examples that we'll be discussing explicitly in the context of condensed metaphysics. So all of this is just, of course, geometry. And then if you're bored, you could also try this out right now. If you just take your computer screen and you take a photo of it, a similar effect like the Warbrick house um, will emerge. You have the finite resolution of your computer screen and then you know the finite resolution of the camera and you see this uh, very nice Amore pattern emerging in the picture. All right, so how does this now connect to condensed matter? Well, um, let me move this box maybe up here. Can I... um, there's a way to hide this, but I don't know how to do it. So um, I'm going to put it up here. OK, so um, or down here. Um, so to connect this to, to um, condensed matter, the idea is that you take um, lattices, two-dimensional materials, and you slap those on top of each other, um, and you try to do that in a way where you induce a small twist between the two layers. So as I know many of you are working on uh, graphene as a prototype 2D material, this of course is a hexagonal lattice, and I brought this little animation with me. Um, so these are two graphene sheets, um, so red and blue dots here in this little video represent um, carbon atoms of a, of a hexagonal graphene sheet. So it's a honeycomb lattice. And now what we do is we start to twist the top sheet with respect to the bottom sheet. And you see, um, as in the animations that we had before, that uh, this kind of moray pattern emerges, where the length of the new uh, crystal, so the periodicity of this crystal, is now controlled by the twist angle. Now you see a very small twist angle. It's a very long wavelength pattern and it's to decrease, uh, increase the twist angle um, this way. Um, periodicity in condensed metaphysics defines the crystal structure. So 
in a way, if you want, this uh, twisting is a way to um, tune the uh, lattice constants of, of your material that you have, you know, just by putting two 2D materials on top of each other and twisting the top layer with respect to the bottom layer, um, you can control the effective lattice constant of your system. So if you think about this uh, in an um, abstract way, you have these graphene sheets here. So we have this yellow sheet and this uh, blue sheet beneath it. And these are, again, you know, representations of graphene. We have this honeycomb lattice here. And there is um, some lattice constant that is proportional to some small value a here, uh, as indicated here, this uh, little arrow. But now you put these two on top of each other, and this is not a very small twist angle. This is 10 degree, I believe. And what you see is that this now allows you to tune the periodicity from this native, very small constant a to a much, much larger um, lattice constant, which is defined by the uh, Moray structure here. Now, what happens is that um, twisting 2D materials um, allows you to change the characteristic length scales in, a, in the system. But the characteristic lattice constants, the, the length scales in the system, of course, define the bandwidth that you typically find in these uh, solid state materials. So if we start with our conventional solids, um, let's say you grow some solid, uh, the lattice constant of the solid is defined by the chemistry uh, that you have. And it's typically, let's say, around the angstrom scale, which defines typical bandwidths, um, being very rough here, of course, uh, in the electron volt scale. And you can ask, you know, how can I control this? Well, uh, of course, there has been plenty of, of um, progress in controlling these kind of materials by changing the chemistry or by introducing um, uh, dopants to, for example, change its filling. And we have been doing this for quite a while, but now um, recently, this new arena emerged, which um, is illustrated here on the lower right, uh, where you now use the twist angle to define a new length scale. We saw this in the previous animation. And when you go to small twist angle in these systems, what you typically have, for example, for twisting two layers of graphene on top of each other, is that you reach um, length scales, which are around the 10 nanometer scale, so much larger than in these conventional solids. And that's by this geometric um, Moray interference effect. And that in turn defines bandwidths, which are much smaller. So these are typically around the 10 MeV scale instead of you know, the EV scale. <coughs> Furthermore, you now have this uh, twist angle as a continuous degree of freedom that you can use to uh, tune the bandwidth, which is of course something that you uh, rarely encounter in these conventional solids. And because it's a 2D material, you have also other interesting um, control opportunities, such as trying to change the filling, the number of electrons in this 2D material, for example, by putting a back gate uh, onto it. So now how does this help us? Uh, again, I'm drawing very simple cartoons here. We'll go into um, um, more serious research in a second. So in a way, you can think of this as a way, this twist angle idea of controlling the length scales. And with that, you control the kinetic energy scales. So since you can now go to much larger um, length scales, you can tune the bandwidth um, to be much smaller compared to these uh, conventional approaches uh, in solids. So you make the kinetic energy scales, the bandwidth, uh, much smaller. That's how easily you know, electrons move through the crystal. But then you also, you also have competing energy scales, such as you know, potential energy scales. For example, electrons interact in these systems among each other. They also interact, of course, with the lattice via phonons. And now as you tune these kinetic energy scales to much smaller values, you can actually tune, that is the hope, by this um, twisting, the competition between kinetic and potential energy scales. So you can hope to tune into a regime where you know, potential energy scales interactions are extremely dominant. And um, just to mention this, there's you know, further ways of um, controlling these uh, twisted 2D materials. There's this very beautiful work that has been published in Nature where they looked at uh, twisted bilayer graphene, so the animation not quite right for, for this um, prior work. But then what they did is in a controlled way, they put a metallic backgate in a, in a defined distance to this graphitic uh, system and they could really, you know, tune with this screening um, of or via this backgate 
the properties of the material in, a, in an almost continuous way. So if you're interested in that, uh, this is not my work. Um, uh, I urge you to check this, uh, this paper out here. It's very beautiful. All right, so why is this interesting? Well, um, I think this really became interesting when um, people looked at these uh, twisted bilayer, bilayers of graphene and found signatures that hinted at uh, effects of strong correlations. So, of course, one of the uh, driving themes in condensed matter physics for quite a while now has been to uh, find better and better superconductors. So, again, this is a graph that I uh, shamelessly stole off Wikipedia. And what you see is, you know, year on the x-axis, year of discovery of this material. And then <coughs> these are all superconductors and the superconducting temperature. So when these systems turn superconducting is put on the y-axis. And of course, up here is room temperature. We have these very recent results on um, systems under immense pressure that apparently exhibit very high TC. Um, so um, these are of course interesting because they kind of approach this room temperature uh, limit, but they are not in ambient conditions. We, of course, want that, you know, we are close to ambient condition for uh, devices. Now, what you see is there's these green dots here, and actually these new systems up here are also green dots. These are uh, conventional superconductors. They follow, I mean, the superconductivity is driven by phonons, and they follow the BCS theory and are rather well understood, I would say. And then you have these lines that break off this um, green trends here, for example, the group rates up here, these, these blue dots, which exhibit exceptionally high um, critical temperatures, um, actually the highest, um, if you at least consider ambient um, conditions on this plot. And this is, of course, extremely interesting because, you know, for example, can go into the um, superconducting phase using liquid nitrogen for cooling. So this has actually, you know, many applications. But I think it's fair to say that even today, the mechanism of these high temperatures um, superconductors here is, is not very well understood. And one of the driving reasons that um, twisted bilayer graphene became so prominent is a simple observation that the phase diagram that was measured in this um, paper that I um, cite here in the upper right, just looking at it, looks somewhat keen to the phase diagram of these uh, high temperature superconductors. So. Um, here I brought the prototypical phase diagram of a, of a uh, high temperature superconductor, the so-called unconventional superconductors. And they typically look like this, that you have, you know, um, the parent compound with any, uh, without any doping has an antiferromagnetic dome here in the middle. Um, and then on the sides, you see nice superconducting domes emerging as you dope away from um, this zero doping point. This is prototypically, you know, what um, is measured in these kind of materials. And now if we look at, for example, twisted bilayer graphene, we find something that at first glance looks somewhat similar. So we have, um, I stole this from, from this nature paper up here. So you'll find more details uh, in there. We have a um, twisted bilayer graphene sample. It's uh, twisted at an at a angle of 1.16 degree. So it's a rather small twist angle. You know, now define a very large, Moray periodicity. And the logic is you now quench the kinetic energy scales by this large uh, length scale that emerges down to much smaller values, giving relevant, pr uh, giving uh, relative prominence to interaction effects. That's the driving theme. And now they measure transport. And what they see is there is an insulating state here for this particular filling of the system. And this insulator is flanked by superconducting domes. So when you look at this, just on a qualitative level, um, this somehow resembles this kind of structure that um, was reported earlier for these unconventional superconductors. <coughs> so now, um, I think it's fair to say that there's still a lot of debate going on, but I think this really kick-started the field and got extremely many people interested in twisted bilayer graphene because somehow the hope was raised that we can now understand this complicated behavior of um, maybe the cuprates in a fully graphitic system, which you know for modeling is maybe a bit more um, easy. Um, again, I think this is still being debated what you know is actually similar or, or different and whether the mechanisms are the same or not. Um, and we're still trying to trying to figure this out. So now um, 
just mentioning uh, another um, signature that is often also attributed to unconventional superconductivity, which is also found in uh, twisted bilayer graphene. I want to mention uh, nematicity that arises in these materials. So if you look at um, the insulating state of twisted bilayer graphene, you will see that um, when you tune to small enough temperatures, uh, there is an emergent breaking of the rotation symmetry. That's what we mean by nematic order here. It's a rotation symmetry breaking without a translation uh, symmetry breaking. It's illustrated here in the uh, in these plots. I'm going to run you through this really quick. So these are uh, STM measurements. So you can think of this as you know probing the local density of states. And let's first look at this um, far right panel here. This is at, at a filling where you are far away from this insulating state. And what you see is a pattern that is a nice um, um, uh, C3 symmetric. That means you know you rotate by 120 degrees um, uh, symmetric feature here. Now let's tune into the uh, insulating state. What you see is, and this is shown, for example, in this panel that is highlighted in yellow in the upper uh, row here, is that you find these um, stripes emerging. Yeah? So these stripes pick one of the three directions uh, that you have available and obviously break the rotation symmetry that you had in the previous system. And this is attributed to uh, correlation effects and uh, points to this pneumatic order, which is often also seen in you know, unrelated uh, unconventional superconductors. And this has you know, given further credence to uh, or motivated um, these studies that um, there might be something, some, some similar mechanisms going on here. Of course, it's all on the phenomenological uh, level. We're just you know, pointing out similarities, but of course, um, we need a better understanding than that. Um, I also want to highlight really quick that uh, you know, this is twisted bilayer graphene. You can also play a similar game with twisted double bilayer graphene. So now you take two Bernal stacked um, bilayers and you twist these two bilayers on top of each other, and you have twisted double bilayer graphene. In this system, we can even um, get much cleaner data here. So um, we see on a much larger scale this symmetry breaking. So we have you know, a couple of unit cells here. Um, but here on the lower right, we have, um, um, so this first panel here is far away from the insulating state. And then if you tune into or into the vicinity of this insulating state, you really see that there's this um, stripes emerging, which break the uh, C3 symmetry in a prominent way. And you can see that over a rather large length scale. Yeah? So you see this much cleaner than in the case of uh, twisted bilayer. All right, so all of this has um, triggered tremendous efforts and uh, research endeavors into this field of uh, twisted van der Waals materials because, of course, the next step would be, I mean, you can look at twisted bilayer graphene, you can look at twisted double bilayer graphene, and so on and so forth, but you know, you can do more things. You can look at twisted transition metal like glycogenides, uh, any kind of 2D material. In principle, you could think about what happens when I, you know, do this Moray game. And just to highlight how much has been uh, done, I brought this uh, table, which is you know, highlighting some of these effects. And I'm sorting phenomena with respect to their origin. So we have um, topology, which can you know, give rise to certain uh, phenomena that we have in condensed metaphysics. And then we also have you know, what I call electronic correlations. These are you know, interaction effects that can ri give rise to a different class of phenomena. And then, of course, we have um, <clears throat> phenomena that live at the boundary of the two, right? that need both topology and correlations. I'm just filling this table, you know, sorting all these uh, phenomena and effects towards their origin. You know? um, and then you see little references on these, um, on these different effects here or phenomena. And all of these references are from the field of uh, twisted uh, van der Waals materials. So this is, um, you see, all very recent works. And this, it, it all basically started from um, this point of uh, utilizing this idea of twisting front of ours materials to control kinetic energy scales, to control you know, band structures, um, and engineer uh, phenomena almost at will. Um, 
Not all of those are experimental. Some of them are actually experimental demonstrations. Some of them are purely theoretical at the moment. Um, but what I hope to, to convey here is that, you know, there's lots of effort, lots of research going on. There's a plethora of phenomena that are being explored in this um, field. And maybe uh, um, you find your own uh, research interests represented in this um, in this table. So then potentially twist the front of our materials are the right platform uh, for you. All right. So this um, has led to this proposal that I'm using as the agenda of my talk. So we were driven um, by this initial um, push towards twisted bilayographene by the question of, you know, using other materials to um, to do other things uh, beyond the possibilities of graphene. And uh, some of the things I will talk about today, so basically the rest of the talk is going through different materials, trying to um, put different kinds of 2D materials on top of each other to engineer some of the things that you might uh, like to engineer. And when you, uh, if you want, this is in a way a, a, a platform to realize uh, certain prototypical lattices that are relevant in condensed matter um, research. And we'll see some of these lattices uh, as we go on. So in twisted bilayer graphene, you could think of this, it's a bit more complicated, but on a very rough level, you could think of this as engineering a honeycomb lattice effectively. And what we'll do together is um, we'll switch up the materials um, one by one to realize uh, effectively triangle lattices, and then we'll switch gears a bit and we'll use different materials to <clears throat> tune a two-dimensional system into a effectively one-dimensional system. So just to repeat this, so you take two two-dimensional systems, you slap them on top of each other at a twist angle, and you effectively realize a one-dimensional lattice. This is um, something that we'll talk about in a second. We'll then talk about um, engineering also multi-orbital models uh, in, a, in a particular way. So there's really a lot of degrees of freedoms that you can play with when you go through the zoo of um, available um, two-dimensional materials. Potential will briefly uh, touch on how to engineer cargo me lattices. Uh, the 3D flat bands I will skip because it's going to be too much. And then um, well, in an outlook kind of fashion, we'll connect this to the other pillars that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. So that's floquet and cavity engineering and how we believe this could be interesting to combine these different research directions. All right, so <coughs> before we go into this um, endeavor of exploring more materials, I just want to um, motivate uh, that there's really, you know, a lot of materials that uh, out there that you could think about. So here in this graphic, don't worry, I will not go through this big table here. It's just to show you um, that, you know, there's tons of combinations that you could play with in this realm of um, 2D materials and twistronics. If you're interested in more details, um, this reference up here, and this is where this table is from, and you can find all the details here. But I want to focus on this um, um, little schematic here on the top left. Uh, we classified some of the materials that we know um, in these um, different columns here. And as you see already, if you think about how to combine all of those, and we'll do that today, some of these um, um, materials we'll use, uh, in the remainder of this talk, um, you see that you have quite a bit of um, combinatoric space of materials to play with. And we believe this is a, is a potentially a powerful route to uh, unlock novel functionalities. All right, so uh, the first example is maybe the simplest one where we kind of uh, go to a cousin of graphene. So instead of taking graphene on a honeycomb lattice, we now take hexagonal um, boron nitride, and we just take two sheets of boron nitride and we twist them on top of each other. So the only difference, the only difference here is that you know instead of having carbon carbon in the uh, unit cell, you now have a boron and a nit nitrogen atom in the unit cell, and this already leads to one profound difference in this game of twistronics, and that is that you get two ways of creating Morey lattices. So these two ways are either you twist um, boron nitride on another slab of boron nitride at a small twist angle, this configuration A, or you could go to the regime where you twist um, 60 degree plus epsilon. Yeah? So you go uh, in close to 60 degrees. And in for the graphene case where you have carbon and carbon in the unit cell, um, these two would actually be equivalent. But since you now have two inequivalent atoms, boron and nitrogen, um, these are actually two different configurations that you can reach. And you can see that by looking at where you know 
nitrogen sits on nitrogen and where boron sits on boron uh, in these Moray patterns. And this is different for the configuration A, where you know boron sits on boron at the blue place and nitrogen on nitrogen in this red circle, while um, they sit in the same region on top of each other uh, for this configuration B. Um, so the next question that uh, we addressed was, um, can we use density function theory um, to answer the question whether still in this very naive picture flat bands emerge? And this is shown here in these um, panels F and G. So this is a density functional theory characterization of the bands that emerge as you start to twist two sheets of boron nitride on top of each other. We have, of course, the large band gap because, you know, boron nitride is a very good insulator. But then you see that here, um, uh, close uh, to the valence band, there's actually families of flat bands emerging. So we have this first band, which is labeled one, we have and, and highlighted in red. Then we have, you know, this small um, yellow band, and then there's a new band, uh, blue below it, and all of these flat bands emerge. And we can look, for example, at the bandwidth of this. Um, this is at one given twist angle of 2.64 degrees. Now we can, of course, look at the bandwidth of this band labeled one, independency of the twist angle. And we see a nice um, monotonic curve. As you go to smaller twist angle, the bandwidth of this red band monotonically decreases. So um, this means that we can use twisting as a way of controlling uh, the overall bandwidth, the kinetic energy scales in the system. For the experts on uh, twisted uh, materials here, this is another fundamental difference to the bilayer graphene case. So. I didn't say this, but twisted bilayer graphene has certain angles, so-called magic angles, where the bandwidth decreases rapidly and then rises up again. Um, this is a particular consequence of, uh, of the structure that you have in twisted bilayer graphene. Here in um, twisted boron nitride, it's nice and continuous, and that is because you have this nice band gap. Yeah? Um, and for um, for making these samples, that's actually good. that's actually good news, because when you have these magic angles and you try to be close at these magic angles. If you have the slightest variations in your twist angle, then of course you get huge deviations. While if you have a nice, you know, smooth curve, a bit of twist angle variation is not so bad. All right. So then um, I won't bore you with the details, but what we did is we looked at these um, red bands. So if I would zoom here, you can on this resolution, you of course can't really see this. But if you would zoom into this red band, you would see that it follows the dispersion of a perfect triangular axis. You know? So it's Instead of engineering a honeycomb lattice like in the um, twisted bilayer graphene case, we now have a way of engineering a triangle lattice. And then what we can do is we can now study the competition of electronic correlations in this triangular lattice here with respect to the kinetic energy scales. This is shown in this final plot. See here on the y-axis, we have this competition between kinetic energy scales U and um, sorry, potential energy scales U and kinetic energy scales T. <coughs> and on the x-axis, you have a filling, and that filling here is measured with respect to half filling of this flat band. Yeah? So zero means half filled red flat band here. And what we find uh, in our study is, you know, there's a, this axis here can be tuned uh, as we proposed by the twist angle, uh, and you have uh, a crossover from uh, um, a metal into a, a D-wave superconducting state. And then at larger interaction, you would stabilize a, a spin density wave state. All right, so now we want to um, leave this realm of you know, C3 symmetric um, materials behind. So we want to do a, a, a larger step away from twisted bilayer graphene, not just changing carbon carbon to boron nitride, but we now want to go to um, germanium selenide. So we're looking at germanium selenide and germanium selenide has a rectangular unit cell. So it's not like this nice uh, honeycomb lattice or triangle lattice. Um, it's a rectangular unit cell. So uh, in this little animation, let me optimize for the video clip again. Um, so in this animation, what you see, and this connects back to what I said about parallel lines. So in the in the introductory part about Moray, I, I, I told you that these uh, parallel lines being you know twisted uh, with respect to each other will become relevant throughout this talk again. Uh, and this is what you see here. So um, if you now take rectangular unit cells and you twist, you know, the top versus the bottom, what you see is that these um, this Moray pattern will actually give these um, effectively one-dimensional structures, these large 
state structures are one dimensional. Yeah? So again, no quantum mechanics, it's all just geometric uh, interference effect. So what we did then is um, to ask the question, does this mean that our crystal will actually behave like a one, effectively one dimensional system? And for that, we first, um, again, employ our uh, density functional theory. So we look at germanium selenide. This is a depiction of a top and a side view of germanium selenide. And now <clears throat> we uh, slap two of those um, layers on top of each other at a small twist angle. So we get these large Moria unit cells here with many atoms on it. And we again ask the question uh, about the band structure. So at small twist angle, as was the case before, we see these flat bands emerging. Here, for example, in the vicinity of the conduction band, there's this flat band emerging. And this time I brought an inset. So I'm just taking this very flat band that emerges at very small twist angle. And I'm zooming into these scales as shown here. And this is the dispersion that the electrons feel. Now, um, we want to test whether this, these electrons in these bands would behave effectively one dimensional. And um, for that, we need to translate this dispersion, which is in K-space, um, or interpret this dispersion a bit. So I also brought the brilliant zone here. We have the high symmetry points related S, Y, gamma, and X. And now um, let's see what happens when we move as electrons from the gamma to the X point. That's along these, this direction here, yeah, gamma to X. And you see there's a bit of dispersion. The overall band is, of course, flat, but you know there's a bit of dispersion within this flat band. Now, if you go from X to S, that's along this direction here, you see that the band is almost perfectly flat. So there's almost no dispersion along the perpendicular direction. Then if you go from S to Y, that's along this direction here, you see again that there's a bit of dispersion. And then from Y to gamma, it's entirely flat again. And what that means is electrons do disperse along this direction. They do not disperse along the perpendicular direction. And that's one dimensionality. Uh, this is quantified a bit more in this panel F here. This is a twin axis, so I'll walk you through this. Um, the x-axis shows the twist angle, um, so we go to lower twist angle. The overall bandwidth decreases. This is shown as the yellow axis to the right here. This is the overall bandwidth, called t-parallel here, uh, or the overall bandwidth is proportional to t-parallel, one should say. Uh, and as you see, this goes down to smaller and smaller values as you go to smaller twist angle. But then there's also the ratio of um, the quantity that we call t perpendicular divided by t parallel. That's how one-dimensional my system is. So the, um, the smaller this number is, the more one-dimensional it is. Yeah? So it's measuring you know, kinetic energy out of the chains versus within the chains. And as you see, as you go to twist angles that are smaller, also the red line, so this is this left axis here, decreases uh, quickly, meaning that you establish more and more the one-dimensional uh, limit. Now, uh, this is also reflected if you look at the wave functions. So if you look at um, the wave functions, for example, at the gamma point, this is shown in these uh, four panels below, what you see is, uh, for these four bands, you see these um, charge distributions, so this is the wave function squared, um, and they perfectly line along these one-dimensional channels here. You know? So these are all one-dimensional, meaning that what we have done here is we have taken two two-dimensional systems, we have put them on top of each other at a small twist angle, and what you effectively engineer at small twist angles is a one-dimensional system. Yeah? So this is an inroad, an alternative inroad, in engineering effectively one-dimensional systems. All right, so to quantify this a bit more, we looked at small twist angles and we fitted you know, this almost one dimensional band to get the kinetic energy scales um, within uh, the uh, T parallel direction, so the direction of the chain. And um, what we have also seen, and this is important uh, for um, modeling this correctly, is uh, two features. There's, there's this one dimension, but there's this gap opening up you know, between these upper and lower band here. And then also there is a sequence of charge puddles where you have you know, a big puddle, a small puddle, a big puddle, a small puddle. And this is telling you that the effective low energy model that you're realizing is not only you know, um, a, a model where you know, electrons hop along the one dimensional chain, but you also have a staggered uh, on-site potential term, which will favor some of the sides over the others. That's why you get small puddles and big puddles. So um, this is the um, effective, low energy theory that you, um, by binding 
a model that you uh, can fit to this uh, data here. And you have, you know, just a one-dimensional chain with nearest neighbor hopping is the first term here. And then you have this staggered onside potential, with, which gives you this sequence of big puddle, puddle, uh, puddle small puddle. Now, uh, realizing this system, and now we're, of course, also remembering that we have interactions, um, we uh, classified this one, the physics of this one-dimensional uh, Hubbard model, if you know, at a Hubbard type of interaction, and it's quite, quite rich, actually. So you have in this model um, access to four different phases here, um, which are classified in this table up here by the presence or absence of charge or spin gaps and whether you have a spontaneous uh, bond dimerization. So in some of these cases, uh, this bond dimer means that you have a spontaneous hybridization of the bonds. So you, you make a sequence of strong bond, weak, weak bonds spontaneously by the interaction. And then we can you know, draw again the phase diagram. Again, here we have on the x-axis filling, you know, this chemical potential mu, um, with respect to half filling of these flat bands here. And on the y-axis, you have the ratio between potential energy scale and kinetic energy scale, which we hope to tune by the twist angle. Now, um, as you see, there's um, phases showing up. Uh, in, for the strong interactions, we have the uh, mod insulating state, um, which is a emergent state. We have, because we are 1D, we have this uh, fancy Lattinger liquid state here. Uh, I will skip some of the details. And then, of course, we have also prominent places where you have just band insulators, right? Because, well, if the interaction is weak, then obviously this kind of um, dispersion means you have a bond insulator, band insulator. Now, this fancy uh, bond ordered wave state where you have, you know, a spontaneous dimerization of the bond is actually occupying in our, for our numbers only a tiny, tiny fraction of the phase diagram. And it's probably extremely hard to access. So unfortunately, this bond order wave state is probably out of the picture. All right. So um, I'm running a bit out of time. So um, I will change material one more time, and then I will you know, stop uh, and leave you be. So uh, the next material that we will look at is um, just to show you one more example of things that we can engineer here is molybdenum disulfide. So um, this is a transition metal dicalcogenide. Um, you can take two of those uh, slabs and you can put them at a small twist angle on top of each other. And um, the same kind of Moray pattern uh, game that we played before can be played again. And this is shown in this uh, inset A here. So you see that you know you have local stacking arrangements that are controlled by the twist angle and the uh, length scale here. That's you know how little you twist. All right. So then we again run our uh, DFT machinery to find the, the bands. And again, similar to the case of boron nitride, we now find <coughs> families, of, families of flat bands. This is shown in this sequence of plot, uh, plots B here. You see different twist angles. And as you go to smaller twist angle, obviously, you know, the bands become more flat. So the Moe engineering idea works again. However, you know, you have not only one flat band, this blue one here, for example, but you also have a second one, uh, this red band, band below. So this, this blue band has an overall bandwidth, which is shown here in this panel C. As you see, as you decrease the twist angle, it uh, decreases in bandwidth quite substantially, and it follows um, uh, uh, effectively a honeycomb lattice. So this is a way to take molybdenum disulfide and used, um, use twisting to engineer an effective you know, honeycomb lattice with, well, tunable um, bandwidth, but it's not so exciting, I would say. Um, honeycomb lattice, we already knew how to engineer. Now, um, what we can do to go beyond that is we can look at that second family of flat bands. So one important um, note to take here is that we really want these flat bands to detach from the other bands, all the band spaghetti below here, these black bands. And indeed, this does happen. When you go to small enough twist angle, you know, you now detach this flat band. You really want to think about, you know, isolated flat bands somewhere. You don't want these to overlap with other dispersive bands, which kind of make your life messy. And again, this, this looks um, strange a bit because you have, you know, this Dirac cone here in the middle, but then you have, um, even on the scale of these flat bands, you have very, very flat bands attached here at the top and to, to lesser degree so, but still visible on the bottom here. And when you uh, start to think about which kind of um, effective type binding model would uh, give you such dispersion, you can see that you should uh, think about a honeycomb lattice 
with um, orbital degree of freedom, Px and Py, where you have extremely asymmetric couplings between you know, Px to Px versus Px to Py. This asymmetry is shown in this inset here, again, in dependence of the twist angle. As you can see, as you go to a smaller twist angle, um, you can tune this asymmetry to much, much smaller value. And this is interesting because when you go to the extremely asymmetric limit, you would get an effect you're going to get a lattice that is akin to the leap lattice, where you have geometric interference leading to entirely flat bands. Yeah? So we have now two types of flat bands. The one flat band is engineered by the Moray effect. Yeah? So this is the overall bandwidth leap. And then because you engineer a certain type of lattice, there's a geometric reason to get destructive interference on the lattice, like in the leap lattice, that will give you bands that are, in the best case, entirely flat, like a like up here, yeah? All right, so um, what we see is, and this is a general kind of rule here, um, this is a way of engineering families of flat bands. The first family here, uh, the blue one, or the first member of the family is a honeycomb lattice with, you know, S orbital-like structure, so just a regular honeycomb lattice. But the next one is more interesting. It has, you know, a P orbital, PX, PY orbital kind of structure, and this can lead to this uh, geometric interference. There's actually, when you characterize this further, there's actually, you know, another, if you could go to a smaller twist angle, there's another um, member of the family emerging here. It would have D character and it would form a cargo lattice. So that would be extremely interesting. For this system, for this material, molybdenum disulfide, we do not believe that this will work because you see the angles are already very small. If you go to even smaller twist angle, it's very likely that you get strong reconstruction effects, which will kind of kill this very simple logic of the next band that is emerging being of the, of the D orbital character. Um, I will give a brief outlook how to fix this, but uh, for this work, what we did is we, again, looked at this kind of hematonin, we added the uh, Coulomb interaction part, we now have a multi-orbital type of structure here, so we better add a uh, hubbard kanamori type of interaction, so we have, in addition to the regular uh, Coulomb interaction, we have this um, exchange terms, and then we classified uh, the phase diagram. I'm, for the sake of time, I'm just kind of browsing through this. But what you can see is that depending on the twist angle, you can tune the ratio of this exchange J over the um, value of U. And with this tuning, you can um, realize different uh, spin order, so antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic spin order. And in the orbital order, you can also get you know, subleading orderings because you have a multi-orbital uh, lattice. So all of this is made possible by um, more engineering these materials. So now coming back to this um, next member of the family, this um, D type of character, as I said, this happens at extremely small twist angle where you have to be very careful. The way to fix this, and I will not go through this because really I don't have the time apparently, um, is to, again, just exploit uh, the chemical possibilities that you have. So you switch your material one more time. You now look at zirconium disulfide. If you want the details, um, it's in this paper. And here in this material, the energetics are ordered in such a way that actually the first band that emerges is that cargo one. You know? So this is just by the chemistry. Uh, this comes out and you get a nice, these are these um, blue regions here, the, 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 the regions that are encircled by these blue uh, dash lines. And as you see, this is where your electrons live in the first band, and you see they nicely form a Kagami lattice. All right, so um, I will skip through this because we don't have the time for this. The uh, last example that I want to um, mention to you, and you see I'm really just presenting a catalog of uh, materials and using Moray engineering to do interesting things with these materials, is to uh, try to um, um, engineer something different, and that is try to engineer symmetries, and in particular, try to engineer non-somorphic symmetries. So you know you know your symmetries, um, like C3 and so on, rotations and stuff like this, but there's also this class of non-somorphic symmetries where you might want to you know, translate and rotate at the same time. So this is a non-somorphic symmetry, and what I mean by this is best illustrated here in this um, uh, inset C here, this is a symmetry, if you look at the uh, Brillouin zone here, uh, sorry, at the unit cell here, you see that there's a symmetry between this point and this point. But to get this symmetry, you have to translate and mirror. Yeah, So this is combined translation 
and mirror, so a glide symmetry. Um, and this is called a non-somorphic symmetry. Now, what we um, worked out, and this is about to be uh, submitted, is that <coughs> uh, that in a twisted SNS, you have this kind of control. You can control by the by the twisting, you can make or engineer more puddles that actually have this kind of non-somorphic symmetry relating different parts of the unit cell. And what this leads to, and we, again, of course, the first step is to characterize this by DFT, is flat bands. So you see these bands here uh, are very flat, um, but the non-somorphic symmetry now protects so-called hourglass fermions here at this particular point, which is beyond, uh, which is in between the high symmetry points of gamma and y. So there's a you know a whole theory of um, non-somorphic symmetries and how that leads to protected hourglass points. Uh, the important thing here to note, I think, is that this is you know a material suggestion to actually engineer these things in a condensed matter platform, which is um, very rare. All right. So um, if I'm looking at my clock, I think uh, I'm almost out of time. So let me just um, mention a second route that we're following in this. Um, uh, twisted materials business. So, so far we have always kind of considered the low energy effective model that we would get. We're also connecting more from an atomistic point of view to this. And this is uh, works <coughs> that are driven by um, excellent students, uh, Amon Fischer and uh, Leonard Klebel here, where they're really trying, for example, for graphene to write down all the, you know, PZ orbital physics of such a huge unit cell system and then add the atomistic interactions on top of that and try to do, let's say, random phase approximation uh, ansatze on this or even upgrade that to uh, a method that's called functional normalization group. So um, you see that, you know, in there, in, at a twist angle of, you know, 1.61 degree, for example, you have tens of thousands of atoms in, these, um, in this unit cell. And, and these guys worked really hard to get an atomistic description of the interaction effects. And this is shown in these two panels here, B and D. So B shows um, as black shows just the non-tracting uh, band structure. And you see that, you know, they have these flat bands here at the center. They have also dispersive Iraco. And that's because on top of these flat bands, that's because they look at trilayer, just a trilayer graphene, not just a bilayer graphene. But they also have all these bands here and many, many more, which are not shown. And these are all the tens of thousands of bands that are in the unit cell. And then they can, um, look at instabilities. Now, if they uh, um, include um, on the on the orbitals, you know, Hubbard type of interactions or other types of interactions, they can um, see, you know, shifts of these bands because of interactions, but they can also outline phase diagrams, like shown in this panel D here for a certain filling, they find uh, ferromagnetic instabilities flanked by uh, superconducting, superconducting domes. All right. So um, with that, I would like to close because I think my 50 minutes are kind of over um, just to provide a brief outlook on uh, what we haven't discussed. So we talked a lot about, you know, tuning kinetic energy versus potential energy scales. I just want to mention that there's also lots of people looking at, you know, um, Moray engineering as a way of engineering topology. So that will be, you know, kinetics versus, you know, intertwining the bands in a topological fashion. And uh, of course, there's I tried to give you a glimpse at what we have done in the past couple of years, but of course there's um, many more things to explore. There's you know many materials that you could stack and play around with, and at least I think from the theory side, um, it's very easy to do and uh, try to identify a new interesting phenomena that we uh, might have not thought about quite yet. Um, the second uh, outlook that I want to just mention is that um, we believe that it could be quite uh, useful to take this idea of, you know, Moray engineering and combine it with Floquet or uh, cavity engineering, so coupling to, to light fields. And just to uh, briefly mention, so we briefly touch on this in this uh, colloquium. Uh, so if you want more information, um, this is where you could find it. Um, but to, to tell you why we think this is interesting, um, um, the, there, there is a certain, you know, new degree of, of engineerability. So, uh, so far, what we do in this realm of trying to uh, control materials with light is we tune the light field to the properties of the material. And we hope that we don't get excessive heating and we try to kind of just engineer the light in such a way that we achieve control. 
And this has been very tough. Um, so the field has made some progress, but it's still, you know, not at the place where it would like to be. Now, why we think this could be interesting to combine this Moray engineering into the game is that you now can, you know, optimize both ways. You could also optimize the material properties such that you enable this ultra fast light enabled way of control in a particularly useful fashion. The other very interesting thing is that, uh, you know, the same kind of games that we played with the potential energy scale, you can now play with the control. So we said that we are reducing the kinetic energy scales, right? So we're going from, let's say, EV scales to MEV scales. So we can also go into regimes where the driving can be much weaker and um, potentially still have a very outsized effect. And this is particularly uh, important in this field of, of cavity engineering um, because uh, it's, it's tough to get into regimes where you know you have very strong light matter coupling. That's what the cavities are trying to do, trying to confine your light field in such a way that you get very, very strong light matter coupling. So one way, one strategy to, to go into this limit would also be to get rid of competing things like uh, strong kinetic energies. All right, so this is uh, just a uh, brief outlook on what's uh, next. And with that, I would like to close and thanks uh, and thank all the wonderful people that I have the pleasure to be working with over the years. So uh, this is a probably not um, exhaustive list. And I want to particularly highlight uh, the hardworking students here um, that are either in Aachen or in Hamburg with me. Um, and that, that we're really pushing these uh, atomistic modeling approaches, which I didn't have time to uh, talk about in detail, um, but they are really doing a heroic job on, uh, on on pushing the frontiers of you know what's numerically possible here. And with that, I would also, of course, like to thank all of you for your attention, and I'm happy uh, to take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Dante, for this wonderful talk. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Lots of very impressive work. Um, yeah, are there any comments, questions from the audience? So you can, uh, Eduardo Barrios, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dante, for the really nice presentation. I really enjoyed the, the overview of the possibilities. Okay, and I have a technical question uh, related to the uh, uh, MOS2 that mm -hmm. is related to the, uh, this association that you give for the different bands, the S bands and the P band of the P band. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, in that case, did you uh, project the, the the states in this kind of orbitals, and if you do this, uh, if you did that, uh, is it related to one of the molybden or the sulfur atoms? Uh, this kind of bands. Ah, yes. Okay, so um, this is a very good question. So um, what I presented here was on the level of you know, look at these bands and try to fit this band structure, right? Of course, it would be much better to do a vernierization, right? And that we haven't done. Yeah. Um, but you don't need to do the vernierization to tell where these bands are coming from. And I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember now, but it's in this paper. So um, you can go and look it up. We did it in the paper. We are saying where these, where these bands are coming from. Um, but we didn't do the full vernierization, which of course would be the best thing to do. The problem is, you know, you have, well, tens of thousands of atoms in the unit cell, and all these calculations are very hard. Um, already without vernierization, and the vernierization is just you know beyond what we could um, at the moment do. And there are people. I'm not involved in this, but there are people, of course, trying to push in this direction in 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 London, in also in Hamburg. They're trying this um, in Beijing uh, and probably others, which I don't know of. But um, this is not done explicitly. Not done. So this leaves. So you could ask, is there? So this was, I think, plausibilized. It wasn't shown. That this is the case. The vernierization would, I think, somehow show that this is the case. I don't think that there's any other plausible, you know, possibility. But um, in principle, it would leave the door open, right? You could maybe think another type of binary model also describes this, all the features of this. Yeah, I was thinking in that because is the, the model or the type binding model for MOS two is with p and d orbitals, 
more uh, frequently. So then, well, okay, thank you. Thank you for the end. But I think the twisting helps. I think it, it cleans up some of this, you know, make sure. Um, but yeah, I should go back into this paper and, and take a look at it. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other comments, questions from the audience? Uh, maybe I have a question going in this direction. Um, why are the PZ orbitals not important here? Is it just ah? Um, so I, I wasn't talking. So she, I'm not. I, I wasn't talking about the molybdenum disulfide um, bands or orbitals here, right? So, so what I, I was saying, uh, what I would try to say was this: the thing that we get after we twist mimics or engineers uh, a band that has S character or P character, exactly. right? Exactly. So how to link this to the original orbitals, um, that is, I, I remember that is in the paper, but I don't remember the details now okay. um, for this particular material. Yeah. Okay, and it just turns out that the character of these um, red bands can be explained just by taking into account PX and PY orbitals. On a honeycomb lattice, which is mimicking the Moray lattice, yeah. So it has no, it has well, it has some connection, but it's not the original lattice, of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for for clarifying this. Um, if there are no other questions, I would like to continue with another one. Um, um, you mentioned um, in this one D. Um, in this effective 1D crystal, um, um, yes, you have this, this staggered potential. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an idea what is generating this staggered potential? Um, yes, I think we can trace it back. This is, I think, not in the paper, but I think we can trace it back um, to, you know, how, so we have these different stacking alignments, yeah? Mm -hmm. so, Red is, you know, stacked like this, blue is stacked like this. And um, from that, you can derive, you know, that you get a bit of more onside potential in some places and less onside potential in other places. Yeah? So yeah, you can, you can plausibilize it by, you know, you have this alternating. So on this picture, it almost looks the same, right? But there's, a, mm -hmm. there's an alternating stacking sequence here. Okay, I see. And that alternating stacking sequence gives, gives you a bit of potential fluctuation. Alterations, right? So you get always um, one and then the other. Yeah, and that repeats across that chain. Yeah. Oops, sorry, across that chain, you know, it just repeats kind of periodically. I see, I see. Okay. Thank you for clarifying this. Um, are there other comments, questions from the audience? Then, yeah, there is one question from Luis Mochan. Luis, go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm just, uh, I don't know if you explained this or you didn't, uh, but when you change the angle, the size of the cell increases. So I would expect the number of bands to increase. Uh, so you'd have a huge number of bands, but you only showed a few of them. So maybe I missed something. Uh, what happened to all the other bands? Ah, very good. No, I didn't say this. Um, so yes, you're right. I go to smaller twist angle. I get way more bands, right? Uh, the question is, you know, where are these where are these bands? So I think it's only fair to say that you have, you know, this flat band kind of physics. If you have a a flat band like in this situation, singling out of this bulk of bands, let's call them bulk of bands, uh, up here. So if you would show, you know, diff if you would compare different twist angles, there would be this flat band here. There would, would always be these four bands that are flat, and they're getting increasingly flat as you go to a smaller twist angle. And then you would get tons, as you say entirely correctly, there's tons and tons of bands more popping in up here, right? But they do not mix with these bands here. Okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, this is somewhat this, this is somewhat the same story with I don't know whether I have a good plot, but with just twisted bilayer graphene. Yeah. So if you if we take I have trilayer at least. Um, so just take this, this is trilayer. Look at the black bands, yeah? 
ignore this Dirac, dispersive Dirac cone. This you don't have in twisted bilayography. But in twisted bilayography, you have exactly the same. You have these flat bands. You have always, you know, four flat bands. But of course, if you go to a smaller twist angle, the, the, the four flat bands get smaller and smaller in bandwidth. And you get tons and tons of more bands away from these flat bands, right? Ah. But if you if you can tune your chemical, and that's a big if, but if you can tune your chemical potential within the into the flat bands and you go to low enough energies, then all of these tons of bands somewhere else do not matter, right? Um, okay. But I'm emphasizing this because some people also talk about flat bands that are not separated from the bulk of bands. And then I think this gets kind of a, then we get into trouble with all of this, right? If you can separate, then I think, uh, you, it's not so easy to say what's going on. You, know? you need a, a gap. You need the flat bands, then you need a gap, and then you need your bike of bands that kind of pop up due to the twisting. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, I would have an, another question. At the end of the talk, when you mentioned this non um lattices, exactly this figure, um, can you go one one further? You you mentioned there this uh, that we have their flat bands. For me, it looks like a tilted Dirac cone. So what uh, do I uh, not understand there? Okay, sorry. This was probably because I was running out of time and getting hectic. Okay. But um, so we we start from this. We twist again. We we do the same games, right? So we twist. We get this Moray lattice, and then we get you know some part where you have bulks of bands, many many bands. But then you have separated from this the flat bands that emerge. And those flat bands are again controlled in their bandwidth by the twist angle. Now in this plot, <coughs> this is only showing these flat bands. There is, you know, attached to this, there's tons of bands that are not showing. Mm -hmm. yeah? So these, these are the flat bands. And if you go to a smaller twist angle, the qualitative structure of these bands would look the same. They would just be squeezed together in energy scales. Yeah. Okay. The funny thing about the non-somorphic, where this non-somorphic symmetry comes in, so this is all the old, let's say, Moray business, yeah, that we always exactly. saw. Exactly. But the funny thing about, um, and this is this is what this plot is showing, is um, there is a so-called hourglass fermion, and this is this, as you say, tilted Dirac uh, cone, yeah, this thing, this thing here, this crossing point, which is zoomed in here, mm -hmm. that is that is symmetry protected by the non-somorphic symmetry. So it's not like a, a, a Dirac cone, which is protected by a symmetry. Uh, this is the so-called hourglass fermion, which is protected by this non-somorphic symmetry. Mm -hmm. yeah, so why we care about this? So let's say technologically, I have no idea. It's just a, it's just a, you know, mm -hmm. extension of symmetries lead to um, protected features in your band structure mm -hmm. kind of paradigm. Yeah, but I think there's no, or at least I, I wouldn't know about it because also these hourglass fermions, as you can see here, um, it's a bit tilted. The hourglass, I don't know whether I can draw here, but uh, no. But it, I mean, it's even hard to see the hourglass, right? So why mm -hmm. is this called hourglass? You have to rotate it a bit. Then you see the hourglass. If you rotate it, you know, to the left, then, mm -hmm. you know, this, all of this makes the hourglass. And this is where this name is coming from. Um, and yeah, people got excited about this um, because it's, you know, symmetry leading to, to topologically protected features. And it has to be um, uh, in between gamma and y, which it, which it, which it does. This is, this, you know, from the symmetry, because I didn't say anything about this, but from this type of symmetry, the C2y symmetry, which is, you know, slide and mirror, um, you can predict that this hourglass must be between gamma and y. And it is. So this is, um, this is a way of, Finding a condensed meta-based okay. platform uh, where you have hourglass fermion physics plus tunable bandwidth, which is very rare. Actually, I only know of this system. Mm. But but, but the point that I think I'm trying to make is the, the challenge is you know you want something can we more engineer it? I think mm -hmm. that's the game that we have been playing. And for example, yeah, yeah. this you can play it. whether it's useful I don't know, but uh, you can play this game. I agree. I agree. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, are there further comments, questions from the audience? So there is no question in the YouTube chat. And if there is no further question here in uh, from the Zoom audience, then yeah, Dante, thank you very much again for this uh, nice talk. Thank you for working, yeah. More or less late night. I think in Germany it's about past 9 p.m. 
Right, and, yeah. yeah, and yeah, hope to see you the next time in person, maybe here in Guanajuato, yeah. Mexico. That would be wonderful. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you for joining us today.